Hi everyone, this is Phil Travis. It's week four here in History 480 here at Eastern Oregon University, the United States in the 20th century, part one. <clears throat> this week we'll be reading from our main text, the Gene Sohn text. We're reading chapter four and five. Um, and, and we're still dealing with the early period of the 20th century, uh, the lead up to the First World War this week. Next week, we'll be looking at the First World War and its aftermath. This week, we are going to continue our examination of the Progressive Era broadly. Uh, we're specifically going to look at um, Woodrow Wilson, but also just generally the Progressive Presidents. My lecture this week, which hopefully everybody's watching my recorded lectures, uh, my lecture this week is titled The Progressive Presidents, and so it examines... Um, the reform that was ushered in under the leadership of folks like Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and of course also Woodrow Wilson. So we'll be looking at the Progressive Era. We'll be looking at Woodrow Wilson and some of his important reforms and in the lead up to the First World War. We're also going to be examining in Chapter 4 from Gene Sohn, we'll be examining the culture, a culture of awakening in the first two decades of the 20th century. Um, an American cultural awakening that is associated with the emergence of things like consumerism, of spectator sports, of an emergence of, of literary and artistic uh, developments, even revolutions in terms of historical writing and historical interpretations, which I'll talk about in just a moment. I will get your book reviews graded soon. Uh, everyone should have submitted those uh, this last Sunday. And I, will, I should have those done by the end of the week, and I'll have feedback for you to help you when you think about writing the next book review. We have one more book review that's due at the end of the term on um, the book John Dower by John Dower titled War Without Mercy. It's about the Pacific Theater during World War II. <clears throat> so the progressive era, I, I want to just say uh, briefly before I get to the factoid, the Progressive Era rev really revolutionized how Americans thought about politics and their government and society. Um, if you think about it today, why do most people vote for who they vote for for presidency, for the presidency of the United States? I think most people, when asked the question, why do you vote for whoever it may be when it comes to the presidential elections, I imagine that most people's answer, regardless of who they voted for, would be that they voted for said individual because they believe that that individual would do something to improve the country and improve you know, their overall situation. Americans tend to see the presidency and the government as a vehicle that can potentially provide reform and improvement one way or another, whether it's an expansion of government or a limitation of government, whatever it may be, Americans tend to vote for their leaders and they vote for the presidents largely because they see the presidency as an office that's maybe first job is to try to um, oversee or be the champion of reforms and changes that might improve American society, uh, whether broadly in terms of the public good or individually speaking. People vote for presidents because they want presidents to, to sort of fix things. Um, or at least champion ideas that fix things. And to a large degree, I think that you could really argue that probably more than any other period in American history, um, the progressive era is really what sort of ushered in that idea. Progressive presidents, uh, as, as did progressive governors, progress, pro progressive representatives and senators, um, as well as progressives at the grassroots, of course, the progressive era was probably more than anything else a grassroots movement. Uh, grassroots movements like the women's temperance movement, uh, for example, or workers' movements, or um, uh, or other types of progressive movements, really, really pressured, um, um, in some cases, the political leadership to enact reforms in the best interests of society. So I think the progressive era, I, I, I think, owes uh, it. We owe to the progressive era a, a great deal of responsibility for ushering in really a change in how we think about government and society. Um, we have seen throughout the 20th century as well an expansion of, in terms of the role of the presidency and even in terms of how we think about presidential powers. 
Uh, and that's a, a longer conversation. But throughout the 20th century, we really see an expansion of the sort of reach and power of the executive. And likewise, I think you could, you could argue that you also see an expansion in terms or, 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 or a lessening in terms of the power of Congress. Um, and of course, the original thinkers behind um, Western style legislative democracy, like John Locke, had always thought that the legislature, that Congress, would be the primary vehicle driving the governments of the era of Republican democracy. Um, but in the 20th century, we really see an expansion of the power of the presidency and somewhat of a waning in the power of, 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 of Congress. So the progressive era, I think, really is an example of a reform era where it was demonstrated that the government, whether a state government or a federal government, could be a positive vehicle for reform and for improvement of, of the ills that, uh, that society suffered from. Um, and I think that there's a lasting legacy in that in terms of how we think about government and how we think about um, 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 the people we elect to the highest offices in the country. So it's a really influential period of time, um, not only for cultural transformations, which we'll be reading about this week, um, but also for changes in terms of the role of government in society, the role of the president in society. Um, it's a really fundamental um, change in terms of charting the next century into the 21st century even. Okay, factoid for this week. <clears throat> I'll make it short. So when we think about these kind of changing interpretations or, or changing ideas about the country um, during, the, during the early 20th century, during the progressive era, um, and this is the factoid, um, one of those changing kind of interpretations comes from one of the most significant historians of, um, uh, of the last hundred years. And that, of course, is the historian Charles Beard. And also along with Charles Beard, his wife, Mary. Charles and Mary Beard um, wrote, wrote numerous works of history. And they were incredibly influential in uh, the historiography um, of the professional discipline of history. Um, even to this day, um, if you go to graduate school to study American history, Charles and Mary Beard's works are going to be on your reading list somewhere, almost certainly. And a major reason for this, uh, Charles Beard was a professor at Columbia University. Um, interestingly, he, he resigned his position at Columbia University in 1917 out of protest for the university firing um, some of his colleagues that were opposed to the United States' entry into the First World War. But one of the most significant things that Charles Beard did was to write a book called The Economic Interpretation of the United States Constitution. And in this book, Charles Beard kind of began a process of deconstructing the sort of romanticized ideas that Americans often have about the founders of the United States, suggesting instead that economics and class played a factor into the formation of the Constitution, that the Constitution of the United States was not all about this idealism that Americans like to think about, but also had a lot to do with sort of wealthy individuals and, the, to lack of a better term, the aristocrats of the United States at the time sort of protecting their status. And so Charles Beard made this argument that suggested, in, inserted class into the discussion of, of the origins of the United States and the formation of the Constitution that very much um, challenged um, some of the more romanticized notions about the founding uh, figures, the founding fathers of the United States and their motivations in forming the Constitution, uh, suggesting instead that economics and class factored into that. So the factoid for this week, email it to me no later than Wednesday, is Charles and also Mary Beard. Uh, Charles Beard, a professor at Columbia University, a historian, an influential writer in works of history, and perhaps most significant, his economic interpretation of the United States Constitution, which really began a process of sort of um, a rethinking the, 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 the role of the founding figures of the United States in forming the Constitution and their motivations in this by injecting class into that discussion. All right, let's have a great week and let me know if you have any questions. No quizzes or any other big assignments this week. I'll get the book reviews graded soon. 
I'll see you in the discussion forum.